Good morning. Good morning and welcome on this beautiful, warm, toasty day. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Let's stand up and we'll start our service by singing together Amazing Grace. And so together we breathe deeply. We allow ourselves to be still. We let go of all that came before this moment and become present as we listen to the words of our sacred reading. The Lanyard by Billy Collins. <clears throat> the other day, I was ricocheting slowly off the blue walls of this room, moving as if, <coughs> moving as if underwater, from typewriter to piano, from bookshelf to an envelope lying on the floor, when I found myself in the L section of the dictionary, where my eyes fell upon the word lanyard. No cookie nibbled by a French novelist could send one more into the past so suddenly. A past where I sat at a workbench at a camp by a deep Adirondack lake, learning how to braid long, thin plastic strips into a lanyard, a gift for my mother. I had never seen anyone use a lanyard or wear one, if that's what you did with them, but that did not stop me from crossing strand over strand again and again until I had made a boxy red and white lanyard for my mother. She gave me... <laughs> she gave me life. And milk from her breasts. And I gave her a lanyard. She nursed me in many a sick room, lifted spoons of medicine to my lips, laid cold face cloths on my forehead, and then led me out into the airy light and taught me to walk and swim. And I, in turn, presented her with a lanyard. Here are thousands of meals, she said. Here is clothing and a good education. And here is your lanyard, I replied, <laughs> which I made with a little help from a counselor. Here is a breathing body and a beating heart, strong legs, <laughs> bones and teeth, and two clear eyes to read the world, she whispered. And here, I said, is the lanyard I made at camp. And here, I wish to say to her now, is a smaller gift, not the worn truth that you can never repay your mother, but the rueful admission that when she took the two-tone lanyard from my hand, I was as sure as a boy could be that this useless, worthless thing I wove out of boredom would be enough to make us even. All right, let's click our fingers for you. That was beautiful. <laughs> With all the coughing and the crying and the laughing, I don't know how you do it, sweetie. <laughs> oh, goodness. Mm. All right. 
So that poem was about grace. We'll talk about more of that in the message. But for now, let's just center into the awareness of grace, whatever that is. That thing that we can't really understand, but that understands us so completely. And as we sing together, I am remembering. Let us open our hearts to be the recipients of that grace that is given for free, so that we may give grace to the entire world. Here we go. Good morning. These are the words of Rumi. is not a caravan of despair even though you have broken your vow a thousand times come yet again come come yet again Ours is not a caravan of despair Even though you have broken your vow A thousand times come Yet again come Come, yet again come, come, whoever you are, begin again. see all of you here today. So um, the name of my message is called Grace, period. <laughs> you all know what a grace period is, right? <laughs> a grace period is when, say, your electric bill gets kind of caught up in your Christmas cards and you forget that it's there and you, you pay it a little late 
but Southern California Edison says, that's okay, we won't penalize you. They show you mercy. Mercy is another word for grace. That's what a grace period is. <laughs> but my talk is not about a grace period. It is about grace period, period. Nothing but grace. There is only grace. Is that hard to imagine? That there's only grace? Ernest Holmes says that grace is the eternal givingness of spirit. And by eternal, I think he means that grace is omnipresence. And that grace created was, was in place before the world was created and, and breathed the world into existence. And that grace is everything around us, everything within us. Grace is everything and we are grace. And yet, it is hard for our minds to comprehend that and to understand that everything is grace and that we are grace itself. Why is it hard for us to get that? Well, for one thing, we live in a world where infants have life coaches to help them get into the best preschool. I heard that on NPR. There are actually life coaches for babies to help get them into preschool which ultimately leads to the right elementary school, boarding school, college. We live in a world where we are striving for success or to be more or to be better constantly. We also live in a world where sometimes if we have a lot of good, we think we don't deserve it and we feel guilty. So all of this tangles with our perception and our understanding of grace. Today is the day to let all of that aside and simply be present with the grace that is and to allow that grace to bless us as it always is, but to be aware of the blessedness of grace that moves through us constantly. So I just mentioned that grace is a challenge for us to understand. And to that I'd like to also say thank God for poetry. Thank God for that beautiful poem that you read, The Lanyard. Did anybody cry <laughs> and laugh? Poetry reaches us and touches our inner place of grace, sometimes better than mere words or intellect. Music does the same thing, the beautiful song that Jennifer sang for us. And in the poem, The Lanyard, you know, he talks about something that perhaps all of us are familiar with. Has anybody here ever made a lanyard? In camp or scouts or what have you, or pioneer girls? When I was a child, the lifeguards, who were gods and goddesses to me because they were teenagers. They wore red bathing suits and they had red and white lanyards that they kept their whistles on. And that we would hear those whistles frequently when we would run on wet cement or get too many of our little friends on the diving board at the same time. They'd blow their whistles and flash their lanyards at us. And I wanted to be them. I wanted to be like that when I grew up. But here I am talking about lanyards in church, and that's good enough. <laughs> so in the poem, in the poem, The Lanyard, it talks about how the, the mother gives the son life and breath and strong bones and teeth and comforts him on his sickbed, and, and he gives her a lanyard in return. And that's such a metaphor for our relationship with the father, mother, God that God has given us everything. God has given us our life, God has given us our breath, God has given us our body, our emotions, our feelings, our intellect. God has given us music, art. God has given us the scent of a rose. God has given us the, the sand and the sun and the ocean. God has given us the stars. God has given us the giant redwoods. God has given us an infinite number of flowers. God gives us our cells and everything that happens in our bodies. And what do we give God? How do we repay that? Well, on a good day, <laughs> we offer God a little bit of our attention. But so far more frequently, we're caught up in what is wrong with the world and what is wrong with us, rather than what is right with the world and what is right with us. And yet, the poem says, that it's, it certainly is a truth that a mother, father, God offers us more than we can ever repay. We can never repay the debt of our existence. 
But somehow this offering of a lanyard from the small boy is enough. And perhaps our offering to God, whatever that is, is enough as well. In an odd way, the paradox of it being enough and not enough at the same time is part of grace. That grace is so ordinary and so commonplace and yet so rare that we can barely understand it. That's grace, period, too. Now, at this point, you may be wondering, what the heck is she talking about? <laughs> what? I don't, I don't get this grace thing. What is this? Well, let me give you a couple of examples. One of my friends in the church, Brock, is fond of reminding me that this is a sacred building with sacred activity because here in the upstairs, we're practicing religious science. And we're telling each other and we're telling ourselves that we are whole, perfect, and complete some of the time, right? And downstairs, in our rental spaces, we have the 12-step groups where they are telling themselves, perhaps, that they are broken, but they are acknowledging that they are powerless over their addiction. Is it grace to acknowledge that we are whole, perfect, and complete? Yes. But is it also grace to acknowledge that we are powerless over our addiction? And isn't it grace that the two of them, these two seemingly polar opposites, are playing together in this sacred space? As soon as we acknowledge that we are helpless, or as soon as we acknowledge that we are powerless over our addiction, or powerless over anything, whether it's a substance addiction or, or the, the, the rantings of our mind, as soon as we acknowledge that, that we are powerless, we suddenly immediately become powerful through grace. Something shifts within us, and our powerlessness is transformed to power because we are transformed in that moment by letting go and being truthful and allowing the truth to operate through us. So to me, that is grace, period. Addiction, wholeness, perfection, completion, brokenness, it's all grace because it's all opportunity for God to shine. Another thing that reminds me of grace is aging. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I went out with two friends on Friday that I hadn't seen for quite a while. One of them used to work here. Some of you may remember Kristen, who worked here a long time ago, and she's, she's, she's just a young thing. She's 36. But this, <laughs> this friend that we have, his name is Ed. We went out with him, and, and he's my age, which is not 36. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, we used to have kind of this fun, flirty relationship. This time at lunch, we were talking about things like baldness and hair showing up in strange places <laughs> and colonoscopies. <laughs> Entertaining Kristen, who was only 36, she's like, what's the name of that stuff you drink? Before it, go lightly. <laughs> go lightly? <laughs> Are you kidding me? <laughs> But we were laughing at it. We were laughing at the indignities of getting old and how, just how ridiculous it is. How ridiculous it is to be in these, these divine beings trapped in these human bodies and how divine the humanness of us is as well. So isn't that grace too? Isn't aging grace too when we look at it a certain way that it's so beautiful? You know, today we dedicated the flowers to our beautiful Carol over there, and I, it reminded me of, of one of Carol's great friends, Martha. Remember Martha? Yes. Those of you who have been around here remember, have been around here for a while remember her, and she was, she passed away in her 90s, and she was, um, she was, you know, she was an old woman, and she was an amputee, and she sat in a wheelchair over there. I still see her when I look over there, and she was so beautiful so incredibly beautiful. That's grace, too. The ability to see the beauty in everything. What about illness, though? Illness, that thing that we fear because we all love our healthy bodies and our strong bones and our ability to do what we need to do and, and get what we want out of life. 
can illness be grace too? I know that many of you attended the memorial of our friend Judy Rogers where I talked about one of my final conversations with her where she was bewildered in the face of all the love that was coming her way. Because Judy was like a lot of us. She was like me. She was a mover and a shaker. She got out there and she got it done. She was accomplishing stuff. She was working. She was doing what she needed to do and she was getting a lot of approval for that and a lot of validation for that, which she should. But when she became ill, she wasn't able to do any of the things that brought her validation in the past. And she just had to sit there and take all that love. <laughs> How shocking that was for her. She asked me, what did I do to deserve this? I said, I don't know. I think you just showed up as you. And she gave us the opportunity <laughs> to serve. And isn't that grace too? So illness can be grace as well, period. And then there's work. How many of us have worked or currently work? <laughs> Raising children, perhaps, that's a job as well, you know? You know, I uh, sometimes get caught up in this particular job that I do. You may not know that I don't just work for 20 minutes on a Sunday, <laughs> that I, you know, running an organization, that the building needs to be painted, and this needs to happen, and that needs to happen, and there's a lot going on, and sometimes I get caught up in the stress of it. And I bring that up not to whine and complain about my job, because it really is a blessing and an honor to be here, but to help all of us recognize that work is stressful. And it's very easy to get caught up in what is wrong with work and how it stresses us out and how it's, it's, it's anything but grace. But then, you know, there are times when I come through these doors and I look at the light coming through the stained windows, stained glass windows, and I look at all of you and I say to myself, what did I do to deserve this? What did I do to deserve this amazing, beautiful church, building, congregation, the amazing practitioners that we have, our staff minister, our board, our, our office staff, Annette and Barbie, who do so much to make everything happen? What did I do to deserve all of you who show up with trust and faith and take care of one another? If we get what we get by right of consciousness, then something is deeply flawed because my mind is like a hamster cage half the time. <laughs> I didn't do anything to deserve this, really. So much of it is just pure grace. And I say yes to it. I accept it, even when it doesn't make any sense. So in your life, in your work, in whatever it is that you're doing, can you just shift your thinking just a tiny little bit and see the grace that is there and say yes to it? It seems to me that if we take one step towards grace, then grace just rushes in. There may be other ways to cultivate grace. Certainly grace can't be coerced. I can't give you a 10 steps to cultivate grace checklist, right? Grace is something that just happens, but we make ourselves available to it through our willingness. I was reminded as I was preparing for today of a bumper sticker that says, if you are not outraged, you are not paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> And I remember when we had two singers come, the duet, two women singers that came, and they, they wrote a song about the opposite of that. Their song was, if you are not in a state of awe and wonder, you are not paying attention. And I would add to that, if you are not in a state of grace, then perhaps you're asleep. So the time has come to wake up to the grace that is. Again, part of me wants to know how. How do I do that? How do we do that? How do we stay awake when there's so much, it seems like there's so much anti-grace happening in the world, so much evidence against grace? I think we show up. 
we do our best. We release the need to judge. We strive, and if we fail, we forgive ourselves. We weave our lives through countless trillions of little steps where with open-hearted intention, we cultivate a sense of grace in the tiny, tiny moments of our life. And even when we don't do the work of willingness, when we are not cultivating the tiny steps of grace in our life, remember how I said addiction is a portal to grace? Even that is a portal to grace as well. It just takes willingness and presence. And it also, I think, takes building our awareness and our willingness to recognize grace when it happens. I don't have the words to tell you how I feel about the vastness of this mystery where we are sitting right now, this incredible spiritual center that is so filled with grace, this incredible planet Earth that is so filled with grace that there is such a divine undercurrent and undertow and interconnection that is constantly feeding us and constantly blessing us and constantly sustaining us. It is above and below. It is within and without. I don't have the words to say what that really means, but I do have a story that happened in my life that made it very clear to me that grace is the order of the day. Some of you may remember a couple of years ago, when I, right when I came back from India, my, my sweet dog, Stella, passed away. And you know, those of you who know me, who are regular attenders, know that my dogs can constantly bring me into a state of grace, <laughs> even though they are less than graceful sometimes. We just had a conversation in my office before we came out. Somebody said they had the best dogs in the world, and I said, um, no, I question that. <laughs> Your dogs are among the best dogs in the world. <laughs> hmm. Anyway, when Stella passed away, I was so sad, so heartbroken. It felt like anything but grace. It felt like disappointment because she was 11 and I, I was sure she was going to live to 14. I was praying to anybody who I thought could get the job done <laughs> to have her live until 14. I remember the first day after she died, I got up and I said, it's time to feed the dogs. Oops, I mean the dog. <laughs> and then I sang the song that I sing when I cook their breakfast. <laughs> and it didn't work anymore. So I tried changing it to a minor key. <laughs> and that worked a little bit better. And then I had to change all the dog songs to a minor key, all 25 of them. <laughs> But time went on and I just continued to sit in the grief and the process as many of us are doing. This has been a challenging year for many of us, just sitting there willing to see the beauty, willing to see the greatness in that event, in that passing. And I started getting very much aware that being present was the key. Being present to whatever it was that was happening is the key to grace, is the key to, to opening up that portal so that we can receive the good that is in everything, in absolutely everything. And then just one day I just sat down and wrote out this piece that I've talked to you about before. It was called Suffering is the New Joy. And it was about the passing of Stella and the passing of my mom and how with Stella I was very present and I was very willing to do whatever it took to guide her through this process of letting go. With my mother, I was only 17, so I, I ran away from it. I was too afraid. And how over the years I evolved through ministry and through theater, being in a play called Shadowlands where C.S. Lewis says time and time again, the boy chose safety, the man chooses suffering. So I wrote this piece. A year later, I put it on a blog, and I let it go. And then Nipun Mehta, who visited us this summer, picked it up and sent it to 90,000 people. <laughs> and it was so incredibly humbling to receive that grace. Not that it was about 90,000 people reading my stuff, 90,000 people didn't read it, but it went around the world to support these meditation circles that he does, and I got feedback from people running the meditation circles, things like, yeah, we read your piece, that was not a good day for wearing mascara. <laughs> 
But what really, really sent me over to the precipice and over the edge of grace was when I wrote a thank you note to Dupu and I emailed him to say thank you. And he sent it back to me, translated the piece that I had written, translated into Hindi. And I saw this picture of Stella with Hindi that I couldn't understand below it. And I thought about what informed that piece, my every aspect of my life up until then, my church, all of you, because whether you know it or not, you are part of this process. You are part of this process that deepens the theology and opens us up to the mystery and brings us into a greater and greater awareness of that which is beyond words. I thought about all of that, saw the piece in Hindi and said, wow, we, all of us, just created a hug that reached to the other side of the globe and beyond. So that's grace. You see all those levels, all that interconnectedness, all of that intertwining, all of that beauty, all of that power, all of that joy, all of that sorrow, all of that everything, everything like that. Everything is grace. It seems to me that in that poem, The Lanyard, that boy's simple offering of the lanyard, the red and light, right, red and white lanyard, the boxy red and white lanyard that he gave to his mother was just made enough because it was infused with his innocence. And so it seems to me also that if we show up with our innocence and gently weave our lives one strand at a time and then we start involving other people in the weave, all of us in this congregation, without attachment to results, understanding that the process is far more important than the results. It seems to me that if we do that, we are the grace that we long to see in the world. If we give in a graceful manner, without expectation, without results, then we are giving as God gives. We are loving as God loves. We are grace in action. And that is the key to grace. I so appreciate everyone here today on this hot and sweaty day, which is also grace, right? <laughs> this is grace too. <laughs> I so appreciate you being here and participating in this weaving of grace with all of us this morning. We offer our lanyards and our lives up and outward and inward to the one that made us, to God, the creator, knowing that it is simultaneously never enough to pay the debt of our existence. And it is so much better than all of that. It is more than enough. <sighs> so let's breathe into that and know the truth that we are grace and let us pray. Mm. All right. And so I absolutely know that there truly is one life, one perfect life that is God's life that is our life right here and right now. That perfect life is the goodness, is the grace, is the joy, is the sorrow, it is the darkness, it is the light, it is everything that is. And so I step into that and step beyond it and see beyond it to the circles beyond the circle and just trust and know that we are such a part of this incredible mystery that we call God that is so glorious, that is living its life through every single detail of our lives we get to celebrate that and play in it and know it and be with it. And so today I know that our lives are uplifted and healed, that there was never anything to be healed in the first place. There was only wholeness to be revealed. And so we enter this service and leave this service today with new eyes, 
We see the grace in everything. We see that there is nothing but grace. We see that everything is a gift and that the gift is revealed through the small moments, through the large moments, through the moments that we like, through the moments that we don't like. This is grace, and we are part of it. And we are whole, even in our brokenness. How good it is to know, how good it is to trust, how good it is to be one with the one and absolutely feel in this moment that God's life is our life. May we carry this energy with us and this knowing with us and this deep heartfelt trust with us more and more every single day. So let us give thanks. Let us give thanks together for the transformation that I know has occurred today through our spiritual work, through our weaving, through our listening, through our hearing, through our questioning, through our willingness to be in this divine mystery. Let us together bless all paths to God, churches, synagogues, temples, mosques, and ashrams. Let us bless atheists and fundamentalists alike. And let us know that God is in the house, that God is in our lives, and God has got all of this covered. With a heart that is so filled with gratitude, I say, thank you, Spirit, thank you, God, and I release these words into the mystery, and together we say, and so it is. I have been interrupted by the banks of the river. I have been obstructed by the boulders of illusion. So I go beyond the banks, I go beyond the confines of this riverbed. I go beyond the banks, I go beyond bankruptcy. Cause I must flow. I am infinite, I span the currency of heaven. I have made a decision to let go of the story I have made a commitment to let love reign so I go beyond the fear I go beyond the patterns of my little mind. I go beyond the fears. I go beyond the systems of this little world. Cause I must flow. I am infinite. I spend the currency of 